Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here. Uh, first and foremost, for those of you who tuned in expecting to hear from me uh, at this um, Healing With Him conference, I do apologize for my absence. Uh, it was not without cause. We're dealing with a family situation that we are hoping to have a positive conclusion to uh, that came up literally at the last minute and it was of the utmost urgency and it required my attention as the head of the family. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'm gonna do the best I can to give you a real quick synopsis of the points that I wanted to touch on and hopefully the next time I'm in front of you, uh, it will at least serve as a point of reference. When speaking with Dr. V, there were seven points that she found interesting about my conversation. Uh, I can't open up with them in depth right now because of everything that's going on and I'm trying to hurry up and get through this, but I wanted to just touch some points. The, the first is role models are more than flesh and blood and that comes from the impact of being reared by my great grandparents. My grandmother's parents reared me and in doing so, I gained a, a unique sense of manhood expressed in one of the most rawest forms, but one of the most powerful forms. My grandfather wasn't real romantically touchy-feely type person, but he expressed his love for my grandmother by making sure everything she needed, she had, by being a protector, uh, by obviously being a provider, but not in the sense, not just in the sense that most people see it today. And I'll get into that in a little bit. He taught me lessons along the way. At about seven years old, he came to my grandmother who had been the nurturer and the teacher to that point. And he says, I got it from here. From this point on, you no longer discipline him. All discipline comes through me. And if there's any problems, you let me know. And I eventually asked why. Uh, later on, probably about 13 or 14, why he wouldn't let her discipline me and he said he didn't want me being conditioned to be dominated by a woman he said you can't lead someone or cover someone or be out in front and protect someone that you're looking for her to tell you what to do he says in order to be a leader you got to stand up and you got to be able to move and you cannot be intimidated by a strong woman and if you stay under her long enough you will be trained to look to the woman to make the choices, to make the decisions, to be responsible, to tell you what to do. And that's not your role. And he never ever in any way in word or action gave me the impression that my role was to dominate a woman, control a woman, or to mishandle a woman. But it was to be the head and, and, and in, the, in the sense of everything stops with me. If you're going to do anything to my family, you gotta come through me. If something's going wrong, it's my responsibility to fix it. And that's something that my grandmother would tell told me one one time. She said, You know what makes your father a man? Not that he's perfect, not that he always makes the right decisions, but real simply put, if he doesn't make the right decision, he always fixes it. He's always going to come back and make right what went wrong. It's his responsibility. He sees it as his responsibility. And he uh, acts accordingly. Uh, there's so much more I want to break out on that. I talk a lot about the importance of manhood, uh, trauma, and everything in my book, Born in Captivity. I think they're uh, going to make that available to you that, that want to really check out what I'm talking about. But I want to get into it. The second thing is myths around money. Uh, the point on that is society has trained us to devalue what's important. Um, and then let's talk about that. The commodification of the black man in particular. The commodification of the black man is something that started to take place around the late 50s into the 60s and the 70s. It was the creation of a situation in which black men were underemployed unemployed and unempowered at a rate far greater than any other man and the notion was created that the black man could not support his family well in many instances that was the case simultaneously 
that was a rise of other ways for black women to find support. Some became fluid in their own way. Some became highly educated and empowered. Some fell underneath the support of social systems. But there was this thing that says, if you can't pay my bills, what good are you? And then for the woman who could pay her own bills, it became, I don't need a man. And everything was centered around the commodification of the man, the man and his money and what he could bring. And don't get me wrong. I believe that if a man is capable of fully providing for and paying every last bill in the house, good. Uh, that's my goal. That's what I strive to do. Uh, that's what I've always been focused on. Most of the time I've knocked it out of the park. There have been some rough times, uh, but my goal is always to hold it down. And but, but the, the black man is so much more than that. The black man is so much more than money. And that's where we've lost it. And that's where the problem is. The black man is the identity of the family. He's the primary source of the identity. That's why the woman in most cultures takes on the last name of the man. That's why the children are born girl and boys given their father's last name. It, it is a reminder, so to speak, or a symbol, so to speak, of the fact that the father provides. It, uh, the, a black woman could tell her daughter 50 million times that she's beautiful and it will not measure hearing it once from her father because there's a level of gravity that comes with that. Most girls are going to get a man who resembles their father and if the father wasn't there, a man that probably is a reflection of the void that the father left and so on and so forth. The father is a provider. He is a protector. He is a covering spiritually, emotionally, psychologically. He is the grand total of what can be seen as the pillar that can be leaned into and, 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 and serves as a brace. No matter how turbulent life is for the family and all that are in it, that's what the man is. Manhood is something. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But this idea that a man who a man can only be measured by how much of the bills he can pay. Well, here's what I could tell you about a man. A man who is truly aware of who he is, a man who has done his work, a man who is keenly cognizant of his identity and his his sense of, of worth and value and what he should be doing. If he can't pay all the bills right now and you put the right woman with him, that, 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 that knows how to lean into him, that knows how to affirm him, that knows how to see in him uh, what others don't see. And, and he seriously understands what his, what the, uh, what's, what's the saying today? He knows that he understood the assignment. If he understands the assignment and he can't pay the bills right now, trust me, with the right woman, he's going to grow into the person who can pay the bills. He's going to strive to be a better person each and every day. He's going to wake up and understand, I got to go out and make this happen because he sees the value in her, but he sees the value in fulfilling who he feels he needs to be in order to be the man. Now, but my thing is, don't miss a good guy, a good man, someone who's got the total package because he's short a few dollars right now. Because money, you can always get money. Matter of fact, a woman don't need a man to get money. So what does he bring to the table that you can't provide is what you should be looking for first. Because if you can get it, then he's secondary in the sense of providing it because you can get it without him. What, what are the things you can't get? There's something about the touch of a man that if you sink into it, provides you with a level of security, safety, and comfort, and peace that you cannot deny. There's something about a man's voice that brings a level of calm to the most turbulent of situations. There's something about the protection and comfort of a man that brings about a peace that allows you to unleash your spiritual womb and be able to birth unbelievable things into existence because you are safe. Only the man can provide that. There are things that this man can provide that go so much deeper than what's in his bank account. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not making a case for a deadbeat dude. I'm not making a case for that. I'm making a case for be careful of what you give validity to and what's on your checklist because the things like money, if he's really serious about life, he's going to get it eventually. 
If he's really serious about being a good man and a good husband, he's going to find a way to get it eventually. He's going to make something happen. Okay, provision. Here's this thing. A man's supposed to be a provider. You hear that over and over and over again. And I'm absolutely 100% in concurrence uh, with that statement. But here is where you have to be able to understand the dynamic of provision. A provider isn't solely somebody who pays for the mortgage. A provider isn't someone who solely ensures that the amount of money necessary for the family to sustain a certain lifestyle is present. A provider is the person who provides the peace in the house, provides the direction, provides the strength, provides the level of courage that covers, provides every sense of wellness and well-being that everybody in the house enjoys comes from the covering of that provision that he provides. He provides emotional stability. He provides spiritual strength. He provides a sense of awareness and understanding of who you are. He provides constantly and in so many ways. He seeks to provide new information, new ideas and advice that gives you an, a, a, a sense of purpose and awareness as a child to grow up and be exceptional, extraordinary, phenomenal. This The man is unbelievable in provision beyond monetary uh, uh, value. The power of divorce. Uh, I was telling Dr. V that where I'm at and, you know, I've written a couple of books specifically on marriage. When your house is not a home uh, and born in captivity. I've written a total of 25 books. Uh, a number of other uh, academic papers published. Matter of fact, hundreds of academic papers and thousands of prose articles and a bunch of other work um, that are public publications. But I don't consider them books because to me. For it to be a real book, it's got to be at least 200 pages. But I've got a lot of stuff out there. But I've got two books solely specific on marriage. When Your House Is Not a Home and Merging Souls. And Merging Souls, uh, I talk about a bunch of things uh, that that's pretty weird uh, and to most people. I talk about the myth of dating. I, I told Dr. V I never dated my wife. She came to me for healing. She was dealing with her own childhood traumas and issues. And she came to me. She had already did a lot of work by the time she got to me, but she felt there was something that I had to offer. So she came to me. I worked with her for a while, uh, got to know who she was inside. I got to see her heart from a place, but we were in a professional relationship, so I couldn't approach her. But I, I'm observing her and I'm going, hey, she's special. Hey, that's something awesome about this woman. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at her and then we finished working with her. She goes her way. I go my way. Less than a year later, she comes back around, say, hey, I was just checking on you, seeing how you were doing. And we talked, kind of caught up on what was going on. I had encouraged her to write a book about her trauma. And she wrote, wrote a book called Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters. Um, and she was telling me about that. And I'm congratulating her. And we talked and about a week and a half, less than two weeks into us talking on the phone on a daily basis. I told her I wanted her to be my wife. And I tell people all the time, jokingly, but seriously, the first date I went on with my wife was we were already a couple. We were already committed to be married. Um, I, I simply observed her. And I think one of the things we miss in this whole dating, lustful, desire and romance thing is the power of being able to observe something. Something, my, my divorce, I failed in marriage. That's what I was getting at. I failed in marriage, had to go through a divorce, but the divorce woke me up because I didn't want to experience it again, but I wanted to be married. So in this whole thing of, okay, I want to be married, but I don't want to go through a divorce. What is it going on? And what I realized is I didn't even know what I wanted in a woman. I was getting in relationships because I was attracted to someone. And then if they were kind of cool, like, hey, let's give it a try. And I really didn't know what. So I sat down after that divorce and I sit up and said, you know what? What am I going to do? I'm going to sit down and figure out what I want in a woman. And it looked me took, took me like a year and a half of just really figuring myself. I see that really know what you want in a woman. You got to know where you're going. You got to know how a woman would fit into it. You got to know what you're going to do. What, what, what's your, what's, what's your purpose? What's your passion? What's your vision for your life? What's your work? What is the work that you're going to do? So not your job, your work. Your work is this thing that comes for you. It's there for you. You were designed to do it. Nobody can't do it like you. What's your work? 
One of the uh, things that I learned from somebody I consider to be a mentor that I've got to meet a few times and talk to numerous times uh, and was Dr. Miles Monroe. And one of the things that he talked about was the work of a man. He talked about it a lot. And um, I got a chance to actually attend a conference uh, where he talked about why men need visions and dreams and, and the importance of a vision. And there, there's a scripture that says where there's no vision, people the people perish. And the man needs to have a vision. I tell young women all the time when I'm working with young women, um, I'm telling, hey, here's the problem. You're looking for the wrong thing. You're looking for what he drives. You're looking for where he works at. You're looking for how much money he has in his bank account. You're looking for all these things that society tells you needs to be on your checklist. But this is what you should be asking a man. Not where he works. Not what he drives. You, none of that stuff. You should be asking him, what is the vision he has for his life? Why is that so important? Because where he goes, you go. You need to know, do I fit into the vision? Do my skills, does my skill set, does my strengths settle well with where you're going and what you're doing? That was one of the things with my wife and I. Our skill sets merged. Our passions merged. The things we cared about merged. You know, we're not always on the same page about a lot of stuff, but the, the essence of our passion is the same. Our understanding of commitment is the same. And that's the thing that you have to look at. So in essence, this whole idea of, 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 of knowing who you are, it took me 18, 18, 18 months or so. Then once I realized the type of woman I wanted, I realized I wasn't ready for it yet. Man, I need to work on this. If I'm going to have a woman like that, I'm going to have to be on my A game. You know, I was good. I was successful. Uh, money wasn't an issue. Um, a bunch of other things. When when I did this, man, I was like that dude in a lot of ways. There's a lot of people that was looking and literally saying, dude, I wish. That was my life. But there were things that were missing that people don't get on the surface. You got to be careful of what you look at and what you envy uh, or, or what you think you see and you want. Because a lot of times the outside isn't isn't a total reflection of what's going on on the inside. You, 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 you have to learn that. A lot of people have built up these unbelievable presentations, but that stuff lacking on the inside because they haven't done the work. And so I decided I was going to do the work because I, number one, I needed to know what type of woman I wanted because I wanted to know, be, be able to recognize her when she came along. Number two, I needed to be on my A game because I wanted to be able to hold her. And when I talk about hold her, I don't mean hold her in the physical sense. I mean, hold her with my presence, hold her with my existence, hold her with the force of my love and power and willingness to protect her. I need to be that. And if you truly understand life, you understand it's not as easy as it sounds because you have the desire. You may even have the will and go to go in and get it done. But sometimes you're a little off because what she needs is not where you're at. You're trying to give her something. She says, that's not it. I want this. I need this to be pay. I, I need this to be at peace. I need this to feel safe. I need this. And you got to be willing to listen, get out of your ego, because a lot of times what we want to do is we get that old thing and that old mentality, that old mindset, you know, do as to others as you have them doing. The problem is that if, if I like ice cream and you don't like ice cream, me giving you all the ice cream in the world isn't going to serve you well. It's not going to do it. And we got to learn how to say, okay, this is what I want, but what does she need? And, you know, it also, it takes away that, 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 that that urge to be right see at some point it, it, it that there's this thing i don't need to be right anymore i need her to be okay and i've got to be strong enough in who i am to believe that i can withstand putting something aside to make sure she's okay and then i've got to trust that there'll be times she'll do the same for me okay i could go on to this and we could talk about this uh forever but let's move on. The fifth one is the measure of a man. Mm. The measure of a man. Something that I was taught, something that I was taught, uh, and I believe it, and the way that I express it is this. The truest reflection of a man's character is the countenance of his wife. You can look into the face of a woman when you mention her husband, if he's not present. And you mention her and the continence of this woman will tell you the character of this man. He'll, it'll tell you if he's really being the man that he says he is with her. Is he loving? Is he protecting? Is he, is, is, is he a provider? Is, is he a covering? Uh, can she lean into him? Can she trust him? 
And the trust word is so huge in this thing. And you can look into her eyes. You can see it in her face. Even if he's not there, you just say his name. You can see the continents change. You can see her light up. Or if the phone call rings and she sees it, like, hey, that's you'll see the smile and change. And you can see the in the continents of her, the character of him. That's the first measure of a man that 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 is the continents of his wife. Is he putting her in a place of safety? Is he putting her in a place of joy? Now, it's her place to find the happiness within the confinement of this environment of peace and joy. But the, is he providing the consistency that she needs is the question. And, 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 and that's the thing. And people talk about masculinity. And there's an assault from where I'm standing on masculinity. You hear the term toxic masculinity. I tell people all the time, there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Any of the behaviors that you consider to be toxic aren't masculine. They're simply aligned with what is believed to be masculine behavior. And then it's called toxic. No, see, masculinity is the reflection of your truest state. And for manhood, masculinity is a reflection of that. So when I talk about being a man, my masculinity is reflected. Am I carrying out the things that make me a man? That is, it has nothing to do with machoism. It has nothing to do with how forceful or, or bruteful you can be. It has to do, am I taking care of my home? Bible says, who do that? He who, is, that's, who does not take care of his own, especially those of his household, is worse than the infidel. And so, am I taking care of home? Am I, am, 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 can my wife trust me? Does she have to be concerned when I'm not in her presence? I was watching uh, a reading, excuse me, uh, a, a, a post where someone had shared something that uh, a gospel singer, I'm not going to put her name out of there because I actually know the family, but a gospel singer was talking about how when she has friends and stuff come down to spend the weekend, she doesn't let them stay at her house. She gets them a hotel room because she doesn't want them in the house with her husband. And the people were talking about, you know, if you can't trust your husband and, and the thing is, um, I, I don't believe in putting anyone in situations that temptation can rule. Um, I have a level of character uh, that's reflected in me that absolutely has nothing to do with my wife. And people say, well, I, the fact that I'm never going to cheat on my wife has nothing to do with my wife. I love her. I, I, I trust her. I don't believe she'll ever cheat on me. Uh, but my whole presence and identity isn't hung on that. My, my, my character is reflected in who I am as a man. And I've decided that I'm going to honor marriage because I hold marriage in a high regard. The fact that I'm married to Marion simply means she's the benefit of that level of commitment because it's not just about, does she make me happy? I tell people all the time that, you know, there's some time I'm looking at Marion, I'm going, I'm really not feeling you right now. She done said something, she done did something or whatever. Nothing ever really major, but sometimes we ain't on the same page. And you ain't on the same page. The slightest things will irritate you. And I'm looking at them, but the fact is, I love you. And see, my love isn't, I'm not talking about a romantic love. See, romance didn't even enter marriage until the 13th century. And actually, it's been nothing but chaos since because everybody's talking about feelings. My feelings aren't what keep me with my wife. Now, she gives me great feelings, but that isn't what keeps me with my wife. My covenant with God and my wife keeps me with my wife. I made a promise to God and my wife to honor the marriage and I will not forsake it. There's nowhere this marriage can go that I'm going to forsake it. I am hoping that this marriage lasts forever, but if for some reasons things get unworkable, I will walk away from it before I forsake it in the sense of bringing something into it that totally taints it. The one thing that will be said is he loved me consistently. He was always there. He never violated the trust of the marriage. Whatever happens that may cause something like that, I can't speak on that. I, I've learned a long time ago. I don't, I don't look for it. I'm not worried about it. I'm living every day to love my wife and it's a beautiful thing, but it takes work. But how do you define masculinity? You, you define it by saying, is he doing 
what he should be doing? Can he be trusted? Does he come with a... Now, I mean, everybody's got their own level of swag. Everybody's got their own level of, of presentation. That thing that makes them, you know, that person. And hopefully that per, that that's a part of the allure. But that's got to be something better. Are you doing some things? Behind that presentation, what do you got? That's the thing. Um, the whole thing is how to win with your woman. So many people go back to that whole provision thing. Don't get it. The whole provision, you know, man's supposed to be right. He's got to pay all the bills. You're missing it. You're missing a big part. You're supposed to be building with your man. You're supposed to be coming together, connecting and building. When you're building, both are contributing. One's contributing one thing, one's contributing another thing. Sometimes you're contributing the same thing, but you're contributing and you're building. It's a level of trust. That's a level of understanding. That's a level of clarity. That's why the man has to have a vision. See, the vision lays out the blueprint. The vision lays out. So both people have an idea of where we're going. Sometimes we're not on the same page, but we're headed in the same direction. One's moving a little fast, one moves a little slow, but we're headed in the same direction. We'll take time at some point to stop and recalibrate, reconnect, take a trip, go somewhere, spend some time together, re 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 revigorate, re-energize, uh, refocus. And then we come back and we get back at it because we understand things are happening in life that we cannot predict. We're not machines. We're growing. And sometimes somebody's growing a little faster. Somebody's taking on something. Sometimes somebody in 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 encounters a new idea that the other person may not be feeling. You got to work through all of that. But you've got to understand, you're building something together by way of covenant. You're in a contract to finish something. You're supposed to leave this world having left your imprint on it. Uh, curious, curiosity and commitment. Those are some things, keys to the relationship that thrives. I just talked about commitment. The curiosity is seeking new ways to make her smile. One of the things that I literally pride myself in in loving my wife are the simple things. You know, yeah, I got the bill thing. I got that. Okay. You know, but here's the thing. I don't rest my hat on my head in whether or not I can pay the bills. I got it, but that's not where I rest my hat. I'm going to tell you why. Anything can happen that could take that ability away from me. And if that's all I got, I lose my sense of my, 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 my value. I lose my sense of identity. And I get lost. And I become devalued in my own mind. My self-image shifts. But if I know, hey, man, I'm, I'm a beast at what I do. I'm a beast at loving her. I'm a beast at being connected. I'm a beast at being present. I'm a beast at touching her most neediest parts in a way that it, it hasn't been done before. I provide her a, play, a level of safety that sometimes I watch her moving in it. And, and it's become so normal now that she doesn't even realize she's moving. She's just going. And I'm just watching and I'm smiling because I know the woman I encountered. And my uh, speaking of which, sorry about that. Speaking of which, um, and yeah, so I'm there, but, 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 but how do something simple like this, this is what I was getting at. My, one of my goals every day, make her smile, say something, throw it off. And one of the things that Marion always says to me, then I'll be done. I went a lot further than I did, but I needed to do this because so much going on right now. I need to just get get into my thing. Well, 